Good day to you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for today's presentation, we will explain about ethnographic approach in sociolinguistic. With me, Rizal Dihawin Fadalah, Bintang Sofia Rizki, and Umi Kulso. Let's begin in the first slide. Thank you. Okay, here I'm going to explain about definition of ethnography. Well, there are some definition of ethnography from some experts. Here, according to Wardell, ethnography is one broad approach to researching the role, cultural norm, and values that are intertwined with language use. This research is generally carried out through participant observation. In addition, ethnographies are based on first-hand observation of behavior in a group of people in their natural setting. It means that the researchers has to do the research by themselves and they report about what they see and what they hear. Then, ethnography study is used as qualitative study rather than quantitative. Okay, well, another definition about ethnography is from Duranty and Johnston. First, according to Duranty, an ethnography is the written description of the social organization, social activities, symbolic and material resources, and interpretive practices characteristic of a particular group of people. And then, another definition is from Johnston uh, that say ethnography presupposes that the best explanations of human behavior are particular and culturally relative rather than general and universal. The study of language involves more than just describing the scientific composition of sentences are specifying their proportional content. Social linguistics are interested in the various things that people do with that language. In part of the ethnography of communication, will be explained about two points, such as communicative competence and ethnography and beyond. Okay, the first point is communicative competence. The term communicative competence is sometimes used to describe the knowledge of how to use language in culturally appropriate way. According to Heim, a communicative competence focuses on an ideal here speaker's knowledge of grammatically of sentences in their native language, whereas Linguistic competence covers the speaker's ability to produce grammatically correct sentences. Communicative competence describes his ability to select from the totality of grammatically correct expression available to him, from which appropriately reflect the social norms governing behavior in specific encounters. Working with an ethnographic or functional approach, we may attempt to specify just what it means to be a competent speaker of particular language. It is one thing to learn the language of the Subanin, but quite another to learn how to ask for a drink in Subanin. It means that to do the first you need a certain linguistic competence, and to do the latter you need communicative competence. Okay, well, as the situation in learning a language, children not only must learn how to construct sentences in that language, but also must acquire a knowledge of a set of ways in which sentences are used. In learning to speak, we are also learning to communicate in ways appropriate to the group in which we are doing that learning. That is called language socialization. These ways differ from group to group. 
as we move from one group to another or from one group one language to another we must learn the new ways if we are to fit in that new group or to use that new language properly therefore communicative competence is a key component of social competence here Himes has proposed an ethnographic framework which takes into account the various factors that are involved in speaking. An ethnography of a communicative event is a description of all the factors that are relevant in understanding how that particular communicative event achieves its objectives. Well, to make it easier, Himes used the word speaking as an acronym for the various relevant factors. That is called Himes speaking formula. So, S for setting and scenes, C for participants, E for ends, A for act sequence, K for key, I for instrumentalities, and for norms and interaction and interpretation, and G for genre. Okay, first is setting and scenes. Setting refers to time and place in which speech takes place. Besides, scenes refers to the abstract psychological setting or the cultural definition of the occasion. Then, participants. Participants include various combinations of speakers and listeners, and addressers, and addressee, or sender, and receiver. Okay, the next is ends. Ends actually refers to the conventionally recognized and expected outcomes of an exchange, as well as to the personal goals that participants seek to accomplish on particular occasions. Then, act sequence. It refers to the actual forms and content of what it say. The precise word used, how they are used, and the relationship of what is said to the actual topic at hand. And then, Key. key refers to the tone, manner, or spirit in which a particular message is conveyed. For example, light-hearted, serious, racist, pedantic, mocking, sarcastic, pompous, and so on. And then, I for instrumentalities that refer to the choice of channel. For example, oral written, signed, or telegraphic, or to the actual forms of speech employed, such as the language, dialect, code, or register that is chosen. And then, norms of interaction and interpretation. Those refer to the specific behaviors and properties that attach to speaking and also to how this may be, be viewed by someone who does not share them. For example, loudness, silence, guest return, and etc. And then the last is genre. Actually, genre refers to clear, clearly demarcated types of utterance, such things as poems, proverbs, riddles, sermons, prayers, lectures, and editorials. Okay, well, we back to the second point of the ethnography of communication, that is ethnography and beyond. In more recent studies, the description of underlying communicative competence and actual language use are combined with critical perspective and other forms of discourse analysis. For example, Duff in 2002 
looks at classroom interaction in a multi-ethnic Canadian high school classroom through ethnography of communication research while also adopting critical and post-structuralist theoretical tests in her analysis. Such an analysis thus draws a button on ethnography of communication perspective and on other types of discourse and content analysis. I will continue the explanation about ethnomethodology. Ethnomethodology concerns with talk viewed as a phenomenon in its own right way. In addition, um, it focuses on the process and techniques that people use to interpret the world around them and to interact with that world. In short, um, ethnomethodologies interest with how people interact solve common problems, maintain social contacts, perform routine activities, and show that they know what is going on around them and communicate that knowledge to others. In solving their curiosity, ethnomethodologies used inductive method. This method means that the researcher building construction concept or proposition based on empirical observations of people's social behavior he observed. And the purpose of ethnomethodology itself is to discover the categories and system that people use in making sense of the world. As later, 1980 states that the aim of ethnomethodology is to study the process of sense making these members of society use to construct the social work and its factual properties. In ethnomethodology, there is the issue of indexicality. Indexicality means people aware that certain linguistic items are associated with certain social characteristics. Linguistic items in indexicality such as an accent, phrase, dialect, and others. Beside them, linguistic items related to norms and values in society are also included, such as smartness, masculinity, and blackness, and others. Then, we will deal with background knowledge as part of communication in ethnomethodology. Um, the purpose of background knowledge as part of communication is to interpret particular sentences or sets of sentences. And we must have some knowledge of the categories that speakers find relevant because we cannot understand others if we do not share certain background assumptions with those others. For example, the baby cried and the mommy picked it up. In this case, how do we understand these two sentences from a child and how do they communicate? We understand that mommy in the second sentence refers to the mothers of baby in the first but there is nothing in the structure of the sentences themselves to tell us this. Next about common sense knowledge and practical reasoning. The first one is common sense knowledge. It refers to the understandings, precepts, maxims and definitions that we employ in daily living as we go about doing things. For example, knowing that thunder usually accompanies lightning, knowing how houses are usually laid out and lived in, knowing how to make a telephone call, knowing that there are types of people, objects, and events.
and then practical reasoning. It refers to the way in which people make use of their common sense knowledge and how they employ the knowledge in their conduct of everyday life, such as what they assume, what they never question, or what they never ask, and how they select matters to deal with, and how they make the various bits and pieces of common sense knowledge fit together in social encounters so as to maintain normal appearances. Practical reasoning focuses on how individuals achieve common purposes by doing and saying certain things and not doing and saying others. In this case, we need converses and analysis items such as rules of cooperation, trust, turn-taking, agency pairs, and others. Okay, for the last slide, I want to explain about linguistic ethnography or sociolinguistic ethnography. Uh, finally, we introduce linguistic ethnography, which is relatively new approach in sociolinguistic, which integrate the study of linguistic practice in a particular setting with ethnographically gained knowledge about societal norms and ideologies. According to the expert, uh, such as Chris in 2008 explained that linguistic ethnography analysis attempts to combine close detail of local action and interaction as embedded in a wider social world. Much of this research has been done within the realm of education and indeed a major work describing this paradigm. And then another expert uh, named Remton in 2008 and seven described the methodological tenets of linguistic ethnography as follows. The context for communication should be investigated rather than assumed, meaning take shape within specific social relation, interactional histories, and institutional regimes. Produce and construed by agent with expectation and repertoire that have to be grasped ethnographically. And analysis of the internal organization of verbal and other kind of semiotic data is essential to understanding its significance and positions in the world meaning is far more than just the expression of ideas and biography identification stands and nuance are extensively signaled in the linguistic and textual fine grain that's all from me. Thank you.